All right, good afternoon. I'll start us off. I'm Jessica Berg. I'm one of the co-deans here. I apologize for uh, the temperature in the room. We are having what is an absolutely beautiful day outside, but it is wreaking havoc with our attempt to keep the air conditioning just right inside, and we are working on that. Um, so I am here to welcome you to this uh, lecture, and it is my privilege actually to do the introduction of uh, Max Melman, um, who will be introducing the actual speaker. Um, Professor Melman is the Peter Sills Professor of Law. He joined the university in 1984 and in 1987 became the director of our Law Medicine Center, following Ali Schroeder, who actually founded the center. He has a JD from Yale, holds two bachelor's degrees from Reed College and Oxford University, and he, uh, prior to joining the faculty, he practiced law uh, with Arnold and Porter in Washington, D.C., specializing in the federal regulation of healthcare and medical technology. He's the author of 18 books, over 90 articles and chapters, and was named a Distinguished University Professor, which is actually our university's highest honor in 2013. His extraordinary work here at Case Western Reserve University actually promised the don uh, um, uh, prompted the donation, a uh, very generous donation, by the family of an alum from the class of 1998, establishing the lecture in his name. They have chosen to remain anonymous, um, but nonetheless, we thank them enormously for funding this lecture. The lecture itself allows us to bring in very high-profile speakers in health law, all of whom are graduates of our school, um, which is another really nice thing for us to be able to have our graduates come back um, and tell us all the interesting things they can see about the building that has changed since they've been here. Um, so it's my very great honor to, prevent, uh, to present Ma uh, Professor Max Melman, who will be uh, introducing our speaker today for the Melman Lecture. Thank you, Dean Berg, uh, and uh, I'm glad you all could come uh, despite the, uh, the looming uh, event this evening um, and the uh, kind of the temperature. Um, so, as, uh, as Jessica said, um, the idea behind this, uh, uh, this uh, lecture is to honor, uh, not me, but our alums who have gone on to practice health law, and in particular who have done so with a, partic with a special sort of uh, uh, a focus or, or um, a commitment to the public interest. And so this is uh, the third lecture that we've had, and uh, we look forward to continuing this uh, as, we, uh, as we celebrate um, uh, alums who have uh, who have excelled both in health law and in the, uh, in, in the uh, public sphere of health law. Um, uh, just to uh, 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 anticipate a couple of programs coming up, uh, we have a program on medical legal partnerships, our annual conference, February 10th, uh, which you're all welcome to. And uh, then uh, on April 7th, uh, we are hosting the first time that a law school has co-sponsored a program in health law with the American Health Lawyers Association. So this is the primary uh, group of practicing healthcare attorneys, and we're trying to bridge, um, uh, create a better bridge between academics in health law and practitioners in health law. So the topic will be legal challenges in precision medicine. Uh, we've just finalized the uh, speakers, uh, the uh, speakers today, and I think uh, it will be a lot of fun. One day, Friday, April seventh. Uh, please come uh, if you can. Uh, today, uh, I am uh, truly honored to, uh, to introduce our speaker. Um, he's Matt uh, Herndon, Matthew Herndon. He graduated from the law school in 1992, um, and he has gone on to a, uh, uh, an amazing career in health law. Uh, currently, he's the chief legal officer and vice president for government affairs at Boston Medical Center Health Plan in, in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, that's an affiliate of Boston Medical Center, the largest disproportionate share hospital in New England, uh, and uh, as you'll hear, uh, uh, very uh, involved in the state's uh, Medicaid program. Uh, previously, uh, uh, Matt served as uh, in-house counsel at Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, uh, which you may have heard of, uh, and before uh, working at, uh, uh, as in-house counsel to uh, major health plans, uh, he was assistant Senate counsel for the Massachusetts, Massachusetts State Senate. Uh, he also was a, a litigator with uh, firms in both Boston and Portland, Maine, and uh, before coming to law school, uh, worked uh, for the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee for now Vice President Biden. Uh, the title of Matt's talk is Medicaid Accountable Care Organizations, A Solution to Rising Program Costs. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Matt Herndon and also in thanking the donors for making this event possible. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's, um, it's also nice to leave the cold of Boston for the balmy, warm weather of Cleveland on November 1st. Um, 
I flew into the airport this morning. The, uh, the Indians t-shirts were out in full force and um, thank you all for concentrating for about an hour here before game time. So, um, so it's, really, it's really a pleasure here to be a, um, a lecturer as part of the Melman series. Um, I did want to talk to you today about really what we affectionately call at our organization life in the vortex. Um, we are grappling with some very significant reform efforts in, this, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And what I really, um, when I try to describe my job to people, I say it's really kind of, it's the convergence of law and public policy and politics all coming together in the form of the Medicaid program and reform efforts around that Medicaid program. So um, with those opening remarks, what I'd like to do is really cover a couple of things through this presentation. And I really hope that people will jump in and ask questions along the way. If not, we've reserved time at the end for Q&A, and so certainly feel free to ask questions then. But this is really meant to be an interactive discussion with all of you um, about this topic and uh, the presentation overall. So um, a few introductory remarks, um, a check-in really on the national Medicaid program, um, and then I'll do a brief overview of accountable care organizations focus then on Medicaid, accountable care organizations in particular, and then we'll talk about what's going on in Massachusetts in its ACO reform efforts. Um, so as Max indicated, I work for Boston Medical Center Health Plan. Um, I'm the chief legal officer there, and this is just a snapshot of what type of organization BMCHP is. It is a nonprofit managed care organization uh, that provides health insurance coverage to Medicaid enrollees in both Massachusetts and New Hampshire. Um, we were established in the late 90s by the hospital really to provide health insurance coverage to the patients, uh, generally free care patients that were coming through the doors of the hospital. And we were established as part of a Section 1115 waiver that the Commonwealth filed with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And our mission is really uh, actually that of the hospital, and that is to provide, um, uh, provide and improve access to medical care for low-income, vulnerable populations, and that's what we've been doing for almost 20 years. Um, we are one of six managed care organizations in the Commonwealth that provides um, uh, Medicaid coverage to these uh, individuals, to enrollees, and we're one of these two MCOs in the state of New Hampshire. Um, in terms of kind of um, a little more background on us, we are a, a top-ranked health plan nationally. We are, uh, health plans are generally uh, recognized by the National Committee for Quality Assurance, known as NCQA, in terms of their progress against certain quality measures. We ranked 4.5 out of 5. There are only, to, as a point of reference, there are only two health plans in the whole country that have a 5 rating, so we're really kind of a best-in-class health plan in terms of our uh, effort and work around quality of care. Uh, we have really historically partnered with the Commonwealth on its reform efforts. Folks may be familiar with uh, former Governor Romney's um, health care reform efforts, which were later very much the blueprint for the Affordable Care Act. We were very involved with the Commonwealth in launching that program. And so that's really a tradition that we are carrying forward now with this very, uh, these various efforts with ACOs. Um, we have about 300,000 members. Um, you can see uh, we have a provider net that, network that includes uh, practicing physicians, hospitals, and then we offer uh, really kind of three, to, uh, three basic products. Mass Health, which is uh, what the Medicaid program is called in Massachusetts, New Hampshire Medicaid, and a qualified health plan which are the um, health plans that are offered under the Affordable Care Act. We, again, we really focus on subsidized population. Massachusetts has a type of qualified health plan that really kind of deals with the working poor, or provides coverage to the working poor. And so that is really our market and our focus as a health plan. So this is just a, a snapshot of what we look like. Uh, Max referenced uh, the fact that we are the me a member of um, the BMC health system and our affiliate is Boston Medical Center, um, again, the largest disproportionate or charity hospital in New England. Um, and so we really work very closely with the hospital in providing coverage to its patients, and now we're working very closely with the hospital on these ACO reform efforts. So let's, let's just kind of take a step back and, and just level set in terms of the national Medicaid program 
Just a reminder that the Medi Medicaid has a joint federal and state program that provides healthcare coverage for low-income families, children, pregnant women, elderly, and people with disabilities. Um, it is a substantial part of the U.S. healthcare system. You can see the statistic there that one in five Americans receive their health insurance coverage via Medicaid, and that Medicaid spending accounts for one-sixth of all U.S. healthcare ex um, expenditures. In terms of demographics, 39% of children, 17% of women, and 13% of men receive their health care coverage through Medicaid. So this is really, a, obviously, a pillar of the U.S. health care system in terms of providing coverage. So uh, Medicaid has obviously been uh, here and, and offered for decades, but we have the Affordable Care Act that uh, expanded Medicaid in the country, and it expanded that uh, coverage for those at 100% um, to 130% of, of the federal poverty level. We have 32 of 50 states, including Ohio, that implemented um, Medicaid expansion. And this is just a map that shows um, you know, the states in blue that have adopted Medicaid expansion. Um, and it's really, a, you know, obviously a very significant part of the Affordable Care Act. Um, it has been uh, a driver of coverage uh, for, for many, many Americans. But as we're going to talk about in this presentation, this and other factors have, um, you know, contributed to the cost of the program. And so um, a lot of policymakers are looking for ways to tackle the cost around Medicaid. So looking at the Medicaid program uh, at the federal level, what you really see on the far left is um, current uh, or 15, 16, and projected 17 enrollment and spending. And that 15 enrollment figure and also the, the spending figure is really kind of closely tracks to the implementation of Medicaid expansion pursuant to the ACA. Um, and those numbers have gone down in terms of enrollment and spending on the federal side. What we have experienced in Massachusetts is largely um, what we describe as churn in the industry, so that folks that may be initially eligible for the Medicaid program often lose that eligibility. Maybe they uh, obtain part-time employment during the year, they lose that eligibility. They might move to one of the qualified health plans that might be offered in the state. And so there's actually a fair amount of movement now between individuals who might be eligible for Medicaid expansion and QHP. And the spending is projected to go down as well. Um, but on the state side, the story is quite different. Um, and in Massachusetts, as we'll detail, it's very different. Um, spending is projected to go up in 17, and one of the drivers for that is the fact that um, the federal government pay pays a percentage of the cost of Medicaid um, expansion right now. It's going to go down from 100% to 95% share in 17, and it goes down to 90% in 2020. So what we're seeing in that projection is the fact that the federal contribution towards Medicaid expansion is going to go down, and that's going to increase the cost on the states that are impl have implemented Medicaid expansion. But it's not the only driver. Um, what are some of the other um, reasons for cost pressure on states with their Medicaid programs? Um, we have a current payment and delivery system that continues to reward volume rather than value in many cases and in many areas. We have slower state revenue growth, which is putting a further squeeze on state budgets and the percentage that Medicaid takes of those budgets. Um, we have high cost specialty drugs. Um, the best example of that is are the um, incredibly um, important hepatitis C drugs that um, are really offering cure rates that are really unparalleled, but they come with a very serious price tag. In Massachusetts, the cost of those hepatitis C drugs was about $100,000 per treatment regimen. Um, states and state Medicaid programs have to factor those costs into the program cost overall. And um, our organization alone had about $20 million in hepatitis C costs just in one year. So that's significant for a non profit health plan with margins of 1% or less at best. Um, another factor are payment increases for specific, specific provider groups that could be driven by kind of market position or other factors, and as we talked about, Medicaid expansion. So while Medicaid has obviously been a very important vehicle for providing coverage 
to individuals. Um, states are really having to look at new ways to tackle the cost of the program and also how to really zero in on quality um, and improving the quality of care experience for members receiving uh, Medicaid benefits. So let's switch gears and, and talk about um, ACOs overall. And I think probably the best place to start um, in a discussion around ACOs is with um, the Medicare program. And um, really what we had with the ACA, in addition to Medicaid expansion, were two provisions that really facilitated the growth of accountable care organizations in the country. And the first was with the Medicare Shared Savings Program, which was established to facil facilitate coordination cooperation among providers who were currently in fee-for-service and really move them into accountable care organizations. And under these programs, uh, providers are really jointly accountable for the health of their patients, and it offers financial incentives to, for those providers to cooperate, to save money um, with things such as unnecessary tests or procedures, and really reward quality. Um, and we'll show a snapshot in a minute around kind of the, uh, the growth of these um, MSSP initiatives across the nation. The other part of the ACA was the establishment of the Innovation Center, which was um, tasked with developing additional ACO models at the same time in the Medicare space. And so this has really um, um, been a significant development in terms of the growth of ACOs as a model for policymakers to consider. So two further iterations that came out of the Innovation Center were the pioneer ACO programs where there were 32 early adopter ACOs chosen. Um, these were designed for provider groups that were already ACO-like arrangements and had significant experience. And there was an opportunity to share more of the expected savings than in the Medicare Shared Savings Program in exchange for taking on more risk. There are actually 19 of these today. The other uh, Innovation Center initiative that grew out of um, the ACA were the next-gen ACOs, and those are really have taken off this year. Um, they're really designed to kind of leverage the best practices that exist under the MSSP and the Pioneer programs, and there's an opportunity for participants to take even a higher level of risk, up to 100%. So on that point, I just want to pause for a minute and talk about um, assuming risk um, as a provider, because that is really what we're talking about here when we're discussing ACOs. We're talking about a very fundamental shift of bearing risk from health plans like ours at Boston Medical Center to the providers themselves. And we'll get into this in more detail, but it is really blending the roles that have been quite separate to date in our country in terms of providers and doctors treating um, patients, insurance companies worrying about the risk and how to manage that risk. And what we're really talking about is, is shifting that risk more and more from the health plans to the providers so that they have a stake in the game from a risk standpoint and a financial standpoint and a quality standpoint. And that's a very big play, as we'll talk about um, during the course of this presentation. So this map shows really where the Medicare ACOs exist nationwide you can see the pioneer in green and the lighter blue is the shared savings and the next gen or the purple. Massachusetts has each of those um, Medicare ACOs going on in its state and you can see Ohio there as well. So um, it has been a pretty far reaching initiative um, and it's one that it continues to have momentum. We're gonna talk a little bit about the early results more on the Medicaid side. I think that um, while we have had the Medicare ACOs now for several years, the results are really still evolving. Um, measurements are still really being taken in terms of the progress around quality and advancing um, the cost savings uh, component. But they are taking root, and as we'll talk about in a minute, um, Medicaid is really the next frontier. So um, as I said, we really have ACO arrangements in all 50 states at this point in some shape or form, largely in the Medicare space, but there are some commercial ACOs that are beginning to develop and eight Medicaid ACOs, which I'll outline uh, in more detail briefly 
in a moment as well. So this just gives you a little bit of detail in terms of some of the key model features, what some of the results have been to date. And I would say that it's, it, it's probably, it's fair to state that the greatest um, kind of progress has really been on the quality front with these Medicare ACOs to date. I think the financial gains have been a little more uncertain and um, are still evolving, but I think that really reflects the significance of this effort and this idea of shifting financial risk from um, health plans or insurers to, to providers and physicians. So we've, I've been talking about accountable care organizations, so let's, let's also just make sure we're on the same page in terms of what they really are. So these are groups of doctors, hospitals, and other healthcare providers who come together to give coordinated high quality care to their patients with really twin goals that I've mentioned already, providing better, more targeted care for members and reducing healthcare costs. Um, the diagram here really reflects what is at core of these ACOs, and that is a very member-centered care plan. Um, so the concept is largely one in which you have um, providers using data often uh, made available by the health plans, um, sharing that data with all members of the care team and having those members of the care team actively discuss with each other the holistic needs of the patient. Um, and so that could involve tackling issues like avoiding unnecessary trips to the ER, managing drug therapies, shortening hospital stays, avoiding duplicate tests and treatments. Um, it's a very patient-centered approach to the practice of medicine and one which really requires active collaboration by all sorts of providers. Um, one of the uh, programs that we, offer, uh, that we offer at, uh, at Boston Medical Center Health Plan is it's a, um, known as a dual eligible special needs plan and that is a type of health plan that is offered to individuals who are eligible for both Medicare and Medicaid. And in Massachusetts, we have a program uh, in that category that we offer to seniors. So uh, folks 65 and up who are duly eligible for Medicare and Medicaid. And we have a very specific care model under that program that is really essentially what we're seeing now with ACOs. And it's one, again, where you are really kind of driving towards very integrated member-centered care. So that's really a pillar of ACOs um, and one that we'll talk about when we get into quality um, in a few minutes. So not surprisingly, with the traction that has occurred through the Medicare ACOs nationally, states are now looking at ACOs as part of delivery system reform. Um, more than two-thirds of states are expanding or adopting new delivery or payment reform initiatives, again, with those twin goals of reducing costs and improving quality. Um, and ACOs are really rising to the top of the list in terms of a model that rewards value-based care that advances an individual's health. So this is, this is what the, the, the nation looks like currently in terms of um, Medicaid ACO initiatives. Um, we have uh, 10 states that are currently operating these Medicaid ACOs indicated in orange and then another six states in blue that are actively pursuing Medicaid ACOs. We'll talk about um, some of these states in a minute to give you a better flavor about what an ACO has looked like at a state level um, as part of the Medicaid program. So I think um, Taking a step back again, um, what's, what in addition to the, some of the traction that's been gained around the Medicare program driving um, these efforts? So it's worth noting that um, many states pursue um, customized approaches to their Medicaid programs by filing what's known as a Section 1115 waiver with CMS. And what that application permits is a state to make certain changes to how it will administer its own state's Medicaid program and also how it will use the federal funds that are contributed towards that Medicaid program. So the vehicle for a lot of these ACO efforts at the states are, is this Section 1115 waiver. 
The other component around these state Medicaid ACOs really involves the availability of DISRIP funding. So that's this Delivery System Reform Incentive Program payments. And this was a part of that innovation center that I mentioned earlier. And it is really a, I would describe it as a, kind of a funding source or the fuel that is really empowering a lot of the state Medicaid ACO reform efforts right now. And the dollars are significant. You can see some of the funding um, that has been made available to states via these Section 1115 waivers. So the second um, column to the right also so shows um, DISD uh, funding, but it's largely, think of it largely as DISRIP funding opportunities. And you can see the levels and the amounts of money at issue. Um, Oregon is one I'm going to spend a little more time on, but you could see that figure of $1.9 billion. Um, and um, you can see the 1.35 that is, involves an early bid submission by Massachusetts, but it's up to $1.8 billion now. California, Texas. So we really are talking about a huge, huge influx of federal dollars to support these Medicaid ACO programs and in the form of this DISRIP funding. So it's really the fuel for a lot of these delivery system reforms that the states are now beginning to undertake. So let me switch gears and talk about um, Massachusetts and um, give you a little bit of an environmental assessment in terms of what Massachusetts is up against as a state that is, uh, I would say, quite proud of the level of coverage it offers to its citizens. It has an insurance rate of about 98%, um, which is you know, very high nationally. Um, but there is a significant cost associated with covering individuals, including through a Medicaid program, with rates that high. So one in four residents um, in the Commonwealth are covered by, by Medicaid, again, known as MassHealth in, in our state. Um, that's about 1.8 million people. Um, and these Medicaid expenses are really large and growing portion of the state budget. You can see the pie chart to the right. It represents 40% of the state budget. So um, if you are a um, state policymaker uh, interested in pursuing other uh, policy objectives, uh, interested in funding other um, parts of state government, whether it's schools or local aid, you are looking um, at a very significant percentage of your budget being taken up by one program in the form of Medicaid. And that is a very significant challenge for a policymaker. So that 40% um, percent, that 40 percent of the overall state budget being locked in on Medicaid is a very big incentive for policymakers to be looking at the tools available, whether it's a se Section 1115 waiver, whether it's DISRIP funding, or dealing with the sustainability financially of the Medicaid program. And so just what have these spending trends look like? Um, you can see how mass health spending has really outpaced state revenue growth since um, FY10. And you look at that trajectory where on a gross program spend basis, it was 9.3 billion in FY10, and we're up to 15 billion in FY16. Um, so just a significant increase in spending for a Medicaid program and for a state to um, be addressing. Um, and so this spending obviously resulted in part from the growth of the Medicaid program, but there's a spending trend uh, inherent in the baseline population that goes way well beyond any impact of Medicaid expansion. So the state is obviously very committed to maintaining a high level of um, insurance coverage for its, for its residents, but it is um, facing a very difficult challenge with a, a spending um, trend like the one we have right now with the Medicaid program. So what is the state um, doing to try to tackle this? Well, um, it's really um, looked to the work um, that other states have undertaken um, in their own Medicaid programs around these ACOs. And Massachusetts, in particular, has really looked at a couple of states, Minnesota, New York, Oregon, among others. Um, and let me spend a few minutes on Oregon, because I think it's really the one that the the state of Massachusetts has probably focused on most closely in terms of um, um, its approach that it's undertaking right now. 
Um, so a couple key components around the Oregon Accountable Care Organization model. Um, it's one in which there, there's a governing body that it must be representative of the delivery system. And so what that really means is that at the end of the day is that you have a governing body that is made up largely by the physicians and other providers that are going to be assuming a greater percentage of the risk for this population. Um, and so from a, from a principled standpoint, uh, I think that's very rational. If the providers are going to be asked to bear this risk, they should have some say in the governance of that, of that body. And so that's a, really a core component of the Medicaid program in Oregon. Um, another component is that there must be two at least member representatives. And I think this really gets back to that, um, that member-centered model of care that I mentioned earlier. I think there's a recognition by policymakers in states like Oregon and Massachusetts that if you're really going to design a program that advances care for the member, you have to hear from the member. And the way that you can hear from the member is to have them on these governing, on these governing boards of the ACO bodies. And so that's a core requirement of um, the ACO program in Oregon and, and will be in Massachusetts. Um, another component of Oregon is really a recognition that you have an existing strong managed care organization program in the state. And so kind of sets up the fundamental dilemma of whether you're going to buy or whether you're going to build. And what Oregon decided is it really makes more sense to buy or probably more appropriately to partner. Uh, why replicate infrastructure um, with providers when it already exists with a health plan, whether you're talking about um, a claim system or whether you're talking about care management programs or you're talking about actuarial services or data analytics. If a health plan has those services, why wouldn't you leverage those instead of build them or again um, for additional costs as part of the larger healthcare system? So that was an important part of the Oregon program that Massachusetts has really adopted too. And then the other component is really um, trying to create some flexibility around these ACOs. And so Oregon decided that um, uh, these ACOs, which they call according to care organizations, as you can see, could either form a single corporate structure and that could be something like a joint venture um, in the creation of a new entity, a new ACO entity, or the providers could kind of organize themselves through contractual relationships. Um, and there's also flexibility in the sense that providers could participate in more than one of these CCOs. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in Massachusetts um, in a minute. So Oregon is very instructive in terms of um, an approach that states are pursuing in terms of Medicaid ACOs and in terms of uh, Massachusetts' efforts um, to launch its own Medicaid ACO. So what are some of the early results around Medicaid ACOs? Um, you can see some savings that have been reported uh, in Minnesota, in Colorado, in Vermont. Um, and those are significant dollars. You know, we're not in the billions, which is kind of the cost trend that we're dealing with in a state like Massachusetts and others. But um, that's real money, and that's, that's significant savings for a state that is tackling a program with very high costs. But they're early, and more will need to be done um, on this front. And then on the second, or the other side of the equation, quality, um, early reports show lower rates of emergency department visits, lower rates of high cost imaging services being used, lower rates of hospital readmission, and reduced inpatient utilization. You know, those are all potential drivers of healthcare costs. And so early indications are very favorable that quality improvements have been made as well. So um, I'm going to detail now um, and move to the Massachusetts ACO reform efforts. So as I mentioned, uh, Massachusetts has filed a Section 1115 waiver with CMS. It is pending approval from CMS right now, and um, we are hopeful for approval any day. Um, the request uh, is for $1.8 billion in DISRP funding, um, which is a significant amount of money, obviously, and fairly high in terms of other um, waiver applications to CMS. Um, we have um, state uh, officials that have been closely working with CMS really off and on for the past year to lay out 
the state's vision for Medicaid ACOs, and have been working closely to uh, address any issues that CMS has had with that application. Um, I'm going to talk about this in a little more detail, but one component that's interesting around the Massachusetts waiver application and the DISRIP funding request is the community partner program. And um, at a very high level, what this is, is an effort to leverage um, really community-based organizations to support that patient-centered model of care that I described earlier. So that could be some kind of, um, uh, it could be a senior housing agency, it could be a social service agency dealing with uh, teens. It's really mm -hmm. leveraging community supports where they exist to support the whole health of the member. Um, and um, this is all driving towards the integration of really physical, behavioral health, long-term services and supports, and these social services. So how does the DISRP funding break down um, in Massachusetts in more detail? Um, how do you distribute that $1.8 billion as a policymaker? Where do you kind of get the biggest bang for your buck? What are you really trying to accomplish? And how does your funding make the likelihood of um, you achieving those goals more likely? Um, so we know that about 60 to 65% of the DISRP investment funding would go towards um, the ACO funding stream. And so that in turn really involves a couple of buckets. Um, the DISTI Hospital Glide Path, which is really delivery system transformation initiative funding that goes to, to DISH hospitals largely, charity hospitals. Um, so a larger percentage goes to those hospitals because they are the hospitals like Boston Medical Center that serve a disproportionate share of Medicaid enrollees. And so they, for example, um, may not have the same kind of population as other hospitals that might have a higher level of commercial, commercially insured um, enrollees. So it's a particular need for a certain type of hospital that's really serving an underserved population. Another bucket are flexible services, which is really a, a host of um, services that the state would like the Medicaid program to make available um, to members. Um, probably the most used example is a situation where a Medicaid member su suffers from severe asthma and the purchase of an air conditioner for that member could make a significant difference in their health um, and their health outcomes. And so, you know, having funding around flexible service, um, flexible services um, is another part of the DISRP funding stream. And then thirdly, it's really ACO startup and ongoing investment. And to the far right, you can see the types of things that that could involve. It could involve really building up the IT infrastructure of providers and practice groups, um, further developing the networks that would be part of the ACO, looking at performance management infrastructure, building up the care models, for example, really driving towards patient-centered um, primary care um, provider practices, and looking at member engagement models. And then secondly, it's really dealing on an ongoing basis with very significant operational costs involving care coordination and population health management. So this is really, I think, when, when you're talking about ACOs from a delivery of care standpoint, that care coordination and population health management is really kind of the key. And it's where a lot of the energy is going on. You know, we are working very closely, for example, with our uh, affiliate at the hospital um, on the ACO. And we were organizing kind of our work recently, and we really had kind of three buckets. We had one bucket that really reflects the work that the health plan does and knows how to do. And, and that's clearly kind of our contribution to this larger effort. And then we had a far right column that was really work that would have to be done um, by the ACO partners or the providers based on their role. And then we had this really kind of interesting middle bucket which represented the overlap of those two areas. And it's really the area where collaboration will have to occur between health plans and providers. And that's really where a lot of the population health management work will go on through via, via contributions from the health plan, whether it's providing data or analytics and the providers in terms of rendering care in the, in the best way possible. So 
this is how Massachusetts has envisioned spending the DSRP funding um, um, pending approval by CMS. And you can see that it's very far reaching. So the other two components um, um, under that ACO funding are the community partners. And what Massachusetts has decided on that front is to zero in on really two types of community partners. The first part involves behavioral health community partners that's really recognized as a key towards moving in, towards an integrated care model. Um, it's, it's well documented that Massachusetts in particular has had a very serious opioid addiction issue as a state. And so this is really kind of a decision by policymakers to, to dedicate um, funding to uh, behavioral health and substance use disorder um, situations and members with those conditions. The other part of the community partner program invo involves long-term services and supports. And that is really a, a recognition by policymakers of the kind of the central role that those supports play in the general well-being and health of members. So whether that's being able to um, have uh, non-emergency medical transportation to a doctor's appointment so that the member doesn't miss that appointment, so they actually can get to that appointment, the state has decided that that is a really high priority in terms of advancing care and reducing cost. And then lastly, statewide investments. And this is really kind of a kitchen sink. It really spans um, the spectrum and involves increased investment in um, primary care um, provider programs and training and down to loan forgiveness based on service. So it's really a much, it's a much broader um, attempt to invest in the larger healthcare uh, system in the state. But that's one example. Yeah. For medical students. Yep. So this is really, you know, how Massachusetts, um, I think, looks at its current system and, and where it would like to go to. It'd like to move from one, a system that rewards volume to one that rewards outcomes and value. Um, it sees the current system as one built on addressing emergency or short-term medical events. And it would really like to move to one where health is managed seamlessly across providers over time time, not on a visit-by-visit visit basis. Um, it sees a current system where doctors are really tre treating the same patient for the same condition without talking to other providers necessarily. And it's looking to move to one in which providers really act as a team to ensure coordination of right services. Um, further, it really sees one, a system in which there's limited transparency into quality and efficiency of care and wants to get to one in which there's a better understanding of quality and cost data that's made available to consumers themselves and also to the providers of all sorts. Um, and lastly, one in which patient information is often stored in silos or in paper medical records. And there's a real desire to move towards um, electronic medical records that are readily available to care teams and the consumers themselves. And then you really see there a statement of the goals, improving population health and care coordination, improving integration of physical and behavioral health care, looking for innovative approaches to LTSS, and ultimately ensuring the sustainability of the program. So um, what's the goal? The goal on this um, Massachusetts Medicaid ACO is to achieve a 5% savings off of trend, which is a significant effort for a state with the kind of spending and utilization that it has now. And the state has really zeroed in on several target savings opportunities. And some of those I just mentioned in the, in the comparison. But it's really looking at ways to reduce the admissions, avoiding the excessive ED visits, um, looking at pharmacy utilization, improving management of behavioral health, radiology and lab utilization, DME, home health, transportation, and managing um, outpatient, occupational therapy, physical therapy, and then overall working more closely with providers. On to the right are just some of the examples of some of the areas the state is really looking to zero in on to um, achieve those target savings. And um, those are significant and clearly are gonna require a lot of hard work, but more importantly, a lot of very close collaboration between all sorts of stakeholders, whether it's the policymakers implementing rules, whether it's the providers uh, executing on the care plans that are developed with the teams, or whether it's the health plans that are really providing the data and a lot of the backroom support for these efforts. So 
Um, I'm going to speed up a little bit because we're getting closer to time, but and I want to leave time for everyone to ask questions. But how is Massachusetts setting this up? They have set up a structure where providers will be able to participate in an ACO via one of three models. The first model is known as the partnership model, and that's a model in which a provider would partner with an existing MCO, either in the form of a joint entity like Oregon or via a contract, and basically the state Medicaid program will pay the MCO a capitated rate for each member, and then those funds will be passed through to the providers who will share in the up and downside risk. So if if the providers kind of beat the targets, they get the savings. If they don't meet the target, then they share in the losses. So that's really model A at the highest level. So it involves partnership with an existing MCO. Model B is one in which the providers decide to partner with the state Medicaid agency itself, and effectively they use the state Medicaid agency as its back office. Um, the risk sharing is more modest. Um, and really, eventually, the providers are paid on a retrospective basis based on how they did against the target. So at the end of the year, the state will look at how they did against targets. If they surpassed them, they'll receive some of the savings. If they didn't hit them, they'll um, share in some of the losses. So um, really leverages the existing Medicaid um, agency resources. And the third is known as Model C, which is an MCO-administered ACU model, which is basically providers that enter into contracts with a health plan and just uh, enter into a contract where they assume risk. And it could be upside and downside risk. It would be both, um, but without the necessity of entering into a joint venture um, or a more formal contractual relationship. What's, what's important from a provider perspective um, in terms of the funding opportunity, as you move from right to left, the funding increases under DISRIP. So if you are a Model A ACO under the Massachusetts scheme, you're going to get a bigger chunk of the money. If you're a Model C, you're going to get a smaller chunk of the money. And the rationale, obviously, is that Model A is moving further down the path of ACO, and so they want to reward providers with more money who are willing to move more rapidly into that space. At the same time, they recognize that many providers aren't going to be ready for that. And so they're trying to create that same sort of flexibility that, that I noted with the Oregon um, CCO model. Um, so this just gives you some high level um, information about each of those models. But I think I'm just going to focus on the top line. And um, as you can see, on the Model A plan, the ACO has to have at least 20,000 lives. For the Model B, there have to be at least 10,000 lives. and the Model C, there have to be five, at least 5,000 lives. And by lives, I mean you, um, there have to be at least that many lives attributed to the PCPs that are part of the ACO. And again, that gets back to the patient-centered model of care that is really kind of core to the ACO effort. And within that core are the PCPs. And that is essentially how the state is going to determine um, how many lives exist under an ACO. They're going to look at how many members can be attributed to the PCP serving those members. And moreover, that is how consumers are going to be assigned to an ACO. So that if I have Dr. Jones as my PCP and Dr. Jones happens to be the, in the Boston Medical Center ACO, I am now going to be a member of that Boston Medical Center ACO. That's a very significant um, you know, uh, undertaking, both to set up the ACO, to establish the funding, to encourage the care, but also to move consumers to that, to that ACO entity. But that is, that is the structure that is contemplated under the Massachusetts ACO reform. So um, quality. Um, this is what the state is really going to be looking to measure in terms of um, quality. Prevention and wellness, chronic disease management, BH and substance use disorder, LTSS, utilization, that integration, and the total member care experience. So again, that twin focus on cost and quality. And then I want to just go back for a minute to this slide um, and talk about um, that risk sh shifting notion that I noted earlier. So um, 
under Model A, let's use that as an example, the health plans will be paid a capitation rate, let's say it's $100 from the state to manage the cost of care of all the members. Um, the ACO providers or ACO partners as they're called will have to bear at least 5% of that risk or at least five of that $100 um, under the Massachusetts reform. So that's under Model A. And that's a significant amount of money for providers that are serving a Medicaid population that many providers would argue is not an adequate level of funding to begin with. Um, and now they're going to be at risk for that 5%. And that 5% um, really kind of ramps up over time um, under each of these models. So for example, under Model C, where you might just be a, um, a practice group that is not going to join a joint venture, you've got 5,000 members um, that are seen by your PCP practice. By the time you get to years four or five under this program, you may be at risk for up to 30%. That's a significant undertaking for a provider um, practice group, but it is uh, a reflection of the seriousness in which the state is approaching this reform effort and its real goal of um, increasing the investment of providers in the cost of care and while advancing the quality of care uh, in the services that they currently render. But it's a very um, you know, significant percentage when you think about it. And then what's not on this list is really those practice groups that are under 5,000 lives. And they are not eligible for one of these ACO um, models. Um, but as you can imagine, in a state like Massachusetts that has rural counties, there will be many, many providers that don't have 5,000 lives that are going to be um, dealing with colleagues and pract um, practices in adjacent counties that are going to be moving to ACOs. And there's going to be a lot of pressure on them with much lower scale, smaller scale to kind of make these reforms as well. And that's really kind of the unstated um, second phase of a lot of the Medicaid ACO reform work, I think, that's, that's taking place in Massachusetts. So um, I think with that, I really wanted to sum up, you know, what I see as the opportunities for these Medicaid ACOs, and that is to advance patient-centered integrated care, to leverage community and other supports in a way that not, doesn't really occur um, under the current program, to create incentives for value-based care by shifting risk to providers in um, you know, appropriate amounts and levels and reducing costs and improving quality. And I think the challenges are, are pretty equally clear. And those are really requiring to providers to assume risk that's previously been held by payers is, is again, a very significant uh, change in the healthcare system. Imposing uh, potentially new and significant infrastructure demands on providers um, where they're not partnering with, a, with an MCO, having to build up infrastructure that enables them to really kind of manage the cost and quality of care in a more significant way. Forcing care coordination with other providers and supports that may not exist in all systems or practices right now. Um, and lastly, really encouraging new affiliations despite what could be very long-standing market positions or governance models or histories. So, you know, that really can't be underestimated. In Massachusetts right now, I think a lot of providers are trying to figure out whether they need to pool their resources with other providers to participate in something like a Model A because they may not have the full 20,000 lives. But that is another, you know, very big part of that in bringing providers together that have very distinct um, operations and histories and governance models um, is, I, I think, not to be underestimated in, in this reform effort. Um, so with that, um, I, I'd like to turn it over to you just for questions. I really appreciate um, you attending today, and I'm happy to, to really have a conversation with you now about any questions that you have.
Yep. So, um, as uh, folks may know, we really had um, what what are largely referred to as, as staff model HMOs um, early in the in the in the health um, care industry, and we had a situation where um, the cost of care was really being uh, care closely managed by the health plans in coordination with providers in those staff model HMOs um, is probably the clearest example. Um, and consumers, you know, I think fairly rebelled against uh, parts of, of that program. And so in some ways, this is a return to some of those concepts, but I would say that the guardrails are, are, um, are different now. We have you know, very significant uh, regulatory structure with the federal managed Medicaid regs that um, really kind of recognize the role of managed care with Medicaid. And we anticipate that those rules will be applied to these ACOs, particularly those under Model A. So those guardrails, you know, provide for very clear consumer protection, enrollee choice, you know, within a single county. Um, and so I think there's a I think there's a regulatory framework that offers um, guardrails that didn't quite exist in that in the kind of the first go around would be my my take on that. Um, thank you. I, the question was around indigent populations and kind of the potential for marginalization for those populations under a program like this. Um, so I think that really gets back to um, this patient-centered model of care um, that I described. I think there is a clear recognition that the Medicaid population has very unique needs. And uh, I think one of the things that Massachusetts is trying to do to address those unique needs is really look at the whole care needs of, of patients. And I think for that reason, the community partner program is very important because it really represents a recognition that members get their care in ways that go beyond maybe that visit to the PCP's office. Maybe it's that community support uh, that's around the corner that offers assistance, whether it's you know a Meals on Wheels for a senior, whether it's um, an air conditioner for someone with asthma. So I think there's a recognition that the needs of the Medicaid population are unique and that there needs to be a very kind of targeted strategy for that population, particularly those with unique needs. I think that also gets to the emphasis around population health and care management. I know in Massachusetts, um, there's going to be a particular focus on um, populations with with special needs, special care needs, um, and there's going to be a requirement that providers get together, identify those needs through an initial health assessment, and then really implement a care plan that reflects the very individual specific needs of a member. Yep. Sure. So the, the follow-up question is around kind of the enforceability of these provisions. So right now, the 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 contracts between the ACU entities and these community partners are going to require um, execution on on the types of services that I described. So it's going to exist there. And it's also going to exist in the form of the funding, so that if a community partner is not really kind of meeting its obligations, you know, that funding could be at risk. One more question. Last question. Oh, I'm just curious about the cultural work about patient community members with the grant body. 
Yes. 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 Okay, well, let's give uh, Matt a hand.